Hi there, Pathway family. My name is Jonathan, and I'm so excited to be spending church with you here today. I hope you've all had a fantastic week and that you're staying warm. We'll be hearing a message from Pastor Rob today that talks about God's sorrow, and it is actually the last message that is part of our More Than a Feeling series. We'll also be hearing some music from our worship team, but before that, we have a few quick announcements. I'm very excited to announce that we have a course coming up. It's happening on February 25th and 26th at the Winkler Bible Camp. We're very excited to be bringing in Professor Arlie Lowen to teach the day and a half course about the life of Jesus in the Gospel of John. The cost per person will be $25, and for a full list of dates and information, you can check it out on the Church Center app. Now let's talk about volunteering. Volunteering is an essential part of our walk with Christ and our journey as believers. Our mission here at Pathway is to help those far from God come to know life in Christ. And one of the ways that we can do that is by working together as a unified body. There are many teams and ministries here at Pathway that are always needing more believers to help further that mission. For more information on how you can get involved, go to pathwaycc.net slash get involved. And lastly, let's talk about giving. Giving is an integral act of worship that shows not only our love for God, but our love for others. It stems from the belief that all we have, are, or ever will be is not ours to hold on to, it's ours to share because God has shared His wealth with us. There are many ways that you can give at Pathway, and for more information, you can go to pathwaycc.net slash give. Now let's head into worship. Oh man. 
Hey, thanks for joining us today as we continue our series called More Than a Feeling. And today we're talking about very specifically the idea of sorrow, uh, which brings with it the connotation of regret, uh, grief. These are the things that encompass this meaning behind this word. If you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Because in there, we have this language being used for the first time um, in terms of its Hebrew usage right here in Genesis chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. Here's what it says. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. And, and then there's this encouraging piece of the passage in verse 8 that says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you so much that we get to look into your word and study it and try to understand it at deeper levels. And so, Lord God, as we're looking into your word today, may we understand you more deeply. May we understand what it means for you to experience sorrow. Uh, Lord, and then what it means for us to be able to experience sorrow in relationship to you. And that we would turn our eyes towards you, turn our hearts towards you, turn our behaviors towards you in a way that glorifies you. In your name I pray. Amen. So, in looking at this idea of sorrow or grief, uh, Webster's Dictionary talks about it this way. Sorrow, grief, and regret kind of mean the same thing. It's this idea of having this deep distress um, within our minds. Right? So, it's the idea. So, sorrow, grief, regret... It's the concept of deep distress within our minds. Sorrow implies a sense of loss or a guilt or a sense of guilt and remorse. When you talk about grief, it implies this heartbreaking sorrow for some kind of immediate cause that's right in front of us. Um, it's kind of like if you've ever been around parents who have lost a little one, it's like that. This, this deep, intense, heartbreaking sorrow. And regret implies this pain. Um, caused by some deep disappointment, some fruitless longing, or this unavailing remorse. It's kind of like the idea of the nagging regret of missed opportunities, of what could have been. And so when we're talking about this from Webster's Dictionary, it gives us these definitions. This is kind of how we experience things. This is how we define things in our own human experience. What we have a tendency to do is take these words, and the biblical authors did the same thing. We take these words and we try to humanize God with them in a way. And we call that anthropomorphism. Now, I know that that's a big word. And I think that one of the best definitions or outcroppings of this that I've seen is from Psychology Today, where they say anthropomorphism is the attribution of human characteristics or behavior to non-human entities, including animals. Some people are more inclined to anthropomorphize than others, but it's a very common way of perceiving and interacting with the world today. So this is kind of what I mean. You know, it's the idea where people, you know, maybe you know people um, who have done this, maybe you've done this, where you have a pet. And, and this pet, we, you, you try to indicate that it has taken on some characteristics of the owner right? Oh, their pet is that way because the owner is that way, right? And like, so maybe the, the pet's a picky eater because the owner's a picky eater, you know? And so we anthropomorphize the pet, the animal. We make it more human-like, more like us. And, and the same is true of what we do with God. We tend to anthropomorphize God. And in other words, we try to explain him in ways that make sense to our human reasoning, our human um, cognitive abilities as it relates to God. So the question that we got to ask then as it relates to this, because I think it's an important one as, as a sub-question to the whole topic, and that is, can anthropomorphism cause misunderstandings? And to that end, I would say yes, and here's why. We are created in God's image, not the other way around. And when we anthropomorphize God, what we're doing is we're trying to explain God in human terms, and there is a danger to limit him to human ways. You catch that? So we're trying to explain God in human terms, and we're trying, and the danger is that we would attribute to him human ways. And what we know from Isaiah is that God says, like, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And so he is something other. He is something different from us, even though we are created in his image. 
Hopefully that makes sense. So when we start talking about God's sorrow, God's sorrow in the Bible is talked about in two ways. Uh, the first way would be, and this is taken from the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery, uh, sorrow over what he has done. In the idea of, of um, not enjoying what he then needs to do or has needed to do. He doesn't take joy in what needed to happen. And so there's sorrow in that. Not that it happened, not that he didn't see it coming or anything else like that. We're not talking about God's ability to know something. This is specifically the emotion attached to it. And so the idea of not taking joy in what needed to happen. And, and, so, and then there's the second idea, and that is that he, he's sorrowful. He experiences sorrow over what we have done. God experiences sorrow over sin. Sin grieves God. And so you have this grief or this sorrow, this regret over the things he needs to do. And then he has regret, sorrow, grief or what, over what his creation has done. Genesis chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, right? The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals and the birds and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them, but Noah found favor in God's eyes. And so here's the context of the chapter, right? So in the first chapter of the book of uh, Genesis, we saw that God creates, and he creates good, right? Like everything is good. And as a matter of fact, when it comes to the creation of man, uh, it says that man is very good when, when we deal with that. And so 10 generations later, like, let's understand this. Like, from the point that God created and he creates Adam and Eve, 10 generations later, only 10 generations later, we find that sin has overwhelmed the world. As a matter of fact, Genesis chapter, five, uh, chapter 6, verse 5 says it this way, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of, human, of the human heart were only evil, all the time. I mean, imagine that. Only evil all the time. And so God announces his plan to wipe out the earth. But his mercy, he will actually, in fact, save humanity and save, save animal life for this new beginning through this righteous guy by the name of Noah, who was the only one considered righteous in his day. And a huge ship called the ark, was to be built to be able to house all of these different animals. Now, the Bible rarely speaks about God experiencing regret. The word for regret in the Hebrew is the word yin, uh, yin nahem, yin nahem. And the word ent is entirely about emotions. It's, it's solely about emotions. It's about this feeling of pain or sadness or unhappiness. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about the use of this term within the text. It not only implies that God feels, it, sorry, this word does not imply that God feels like he made a mistake. That's not the notion here. Often when we think of regret, we think of, man, I, man, I shouldn't have done that. And this is different. This is different. It's possible to experience grief and regret in the way that it's used here without implying any kind of wrongdoing, any kind of mistakes being made. Give, give me an example of what I mean. So as a parent, there are times that my kids do something that I need to correct. I need to discipline. It doesn't feel good to discipline, but it's still good to do the disciplining because discipline is this notion of correction, right? So it's not about punishment, it's discipline. Punishment is, is, is something completely different. Discipline leads to, is a form of correction, right? Because we want to move them in a better direction. And so correction is good. Discipline is good but it doesn't necessarily feel good. It doesn't feel good to see my kids upset. And it doesn't feel good to be upset, even knowing that what I do on their behalf is still good. It is possible to experience grief and regret without implying wrongdoing. And so this verse means that God is unhappy with the current state of mankind. And this is really the low point of human history, right? I mean, we, do, we don't see this again anywhere within the text. God's troubled, he is grieved, he is pained by the outcome of the decisions that his people have made. The men and women, however, didn't grieve their own sin, and, and they 
don't repent. Like there's no desire for them to change in any way, shape, or form. And so it could be said that God's grief exists as man's sin persists. You catch that? God's grief exists as man's sin persists. That's important. You see, we, we, we tend to minimize sin. And we shouldn't. The notion of everybody doing it is not a good enough notion for us to dismiss the enormity of the meaning behind that sin. Sin is egregious to God. Sin is, is brutal. And so it grieves God and His grief exists as man's sin persists. And so if this is kind of the definition, the working understanding of God's grief, how do we see that then getting played out in everyday life, right? In, in, the people, in people's lives. And so there's this idea behind godly sorrow versus worldly sorrow, you could say, or human-centered sorrow. Paul, in writing to a fairly young uh, church in Corinth, this is a, a church that, that he obviously helped found and giving a lot of instruction to, the church was founded by Paul, and it was a source of a lot of frustration for him over time. As a matter of fact, it's not actually even just Paul that Corinth frustrates. After Paul is martyred, after Peter is martyred, there's a guy by the name of Clement. Uh, Clement of Rome is what we often refer to him as. He was, uh, he was a disciple of Peter. And he actually even writes a letter to the Corinthian church, uh, just coming at them hard for the ways that they're living and the ways that they're interacting with each other. And, and, and he even references Paul and Peter in his letter as people that we are to, to some extent, emulate in terms of their commitment to the Lord. And so this was a, a, a church of great frustration for Paul. Idolatry was rampant. False teachers had come into the church charging Paul, um, stating that Paul was not a true apostle. And so they're just really even... Uh, challenging his call uh, by the Lord. And so Paul, what we find in the text is that Paul actually wrote four letters to the church of Corinth. The first letter we don't have, it's unknown, but it's referred to in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. It's, it's just simply known as previous letter, in the previous letter. And so we don't know what's in that letter specifically, but we know that there was a letter before 1 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians is actually, in fact, the second letter. The second letter, of course, known as 1 Corinthians, where we have that, we're familiar with it. And then there's this letter that comes after it in which Paul refers to a, uh, a hard, no nonsense, like essential rebuke of the church of Corinth. It's, it's called the severe letter. And again, we don't know the full context uh, of the severe letter. We just know that Paul is correcting things within the Corinthian church. And, and it was a hard letter for him to write. And the fourth letter, of course, is known as 2 Corinthians. And this passage is a result of the previous three letters and actions of repentance taken by the Corinthian church. So if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to spend the rest of our time in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8 to 11. And in this chapter, we find Paul having this letter that he is writing to the Corinthian church to talk about what sorrow or godly sorrow looks like. Um, and it, there's a bit of a comparative in there with what would be considered worldly sorrow. So 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8 to 11. Again, if you do not know where that is in the beginning of your Bible, there is a table of contents. Just go ahead and use it. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8 to 11. Here's what it says. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. So I'm just going to pause there just for a second. Paul is not an unloving man. The idea of sending a harsh message to somebody or delivering a harsh message to somebody, it doesn't come from a place of being mean or being hateful or being despondent in any way. It's not a superiority thing. It is an act of love. Paul actually did regret. He was sorrowed over the fact that he sorrowed them. He hurt them. But that hurt that he caused led 
to something better, right? I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. And then verse nine, yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry. So listen, I, I'm not happy because you were made sorry. I'm not happy because this hurt you, but because your sorrow, listen, led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. So you see what he does here, right? Like he, he says there's godly sorrow and there's worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow leads to repentance and leads to life. And worldly sorrow is, brings you to death, right? Verse 11. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you? What earnestness and eagerness to clear yourselves. What indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. And so Paul wants the Corinthians um, to realize that though he was hard on them, he doesn't regret it. Like it, it, it bugged him for a little while that it hurt them. But he doesn't regret it because it brought them to this thing called repentance. And this is exactly what a godly rebuke looks like. And so the response of godly sorrow is repentance in verse 9. The response of the worldly sorrow is resentment. Worldly sorrow stops with remorse. It recognizes regret alone. It's sorry for the wrongdoing, but it, it kind of leaves God out of it. Right? So I'm sorry that I did wrong, but it leaves God out of it. So there's no movement to change what we're doing. We're just sorry it happened. And that kind of sorrow leads to self-pity. It leads to self-disgust. It leads to resentment. So far from having a healing effect, it actually embitters a person and causes some people to be depressed. Um, and it just, again, I want to I hang up just for a second there on that bitter piece because I have seen people that when dealing with this idea of regret or worldly sorrow, that resentment does kick in. Like they may be sorry for what they did, but it's typically somebody else's fault that it happened in the first place, right? Well, I'm sorry for what I did, but if they wouldn't have done this or that, those people wouldn't have done that. And, and so we go into this posture that God actually finds himself in a conversation with, with Adam and Eve. In dealing with the original sin, Adam actually says, God, like Adam actually blames God for the original sin. He says, well, listen, the woman you gave me, right? So he blames God and he blames Eve instead of taking full responsibility for his own stuff in it. It's kind of what happens here. And so sorrow apart from God, I want to suggest to you, leads people away from God. Sorrow apart from God leads people away from God away from the way he would want us to function in life, away from taking personal responsibility, away from seeing ourselves through the lens of how he sees us rather than in this self-deprecating self-pity or self-disgust. But the response of, sorrow, of godly sorrow is the idea of repentance. It involves remorse with regret over the sin. And so when a church becomes a place where it has no need to weep over sin, it's a fallen man-centered focus rather than a God-centered focus. A church that comes to a place where it has no need to weep over sin. It doesn't really deal with it. It doesn't internalize it. It is not a shared thing where all of us together are saying this should not be so. And, and, and we desire for God to so change us that we're something different. Not looking at the other person saying, I want God to so change you that you're different. No, like this is internal between me and God saying, God, like I, I don't got this. If there's no need for that, then it's a man-centered church because we elevate ourselves. We, we reduce God to being the agent of our good rather than us, the agent of his glory. And so repentance means more than remorse. The biblical idea is to turn to God, uh, that we see our actions as God sees our actions, and we then submit to his judgment and ask for forgiveness. That's it. It is actually that straightforward. It's more than remorse. It's actually 
turning away from, it's joining the other team. And in this case, certainly it's joining God's team. It's the idea of seeing what we've done in the, through the lens of how God sees what is done. And by the way, our lens has a typical um, view of comparing us to the believer beside us instead of to the holy God in front of us or above us. And so we submit to his judgment. We say, okay, Lord, whatever you need to have happen here, accept that. But please forgive me. And it points to a turn, a change in our attitude, in our hearts, in our minds, and in our life. And I just want to tell you that true repentance leads to life in Christ. Like, sorrow that is apart from God leads man away from God, but true repentance leads to life in Christ. There's a freedom that comes in. And it's, it's often contagious. Like the genuineness of broken hearts of God's people could actually be used to bring other people to God, to the church, and experience life in Christ. That's a significant difference between the world's sorrow and, and godly sorrow. The result of godly sorrow then is redemption that we find in verse 10. The result of worldly sorrow is death, right? So when you say you're sorry just for the sake of saying you're sorry, that is no life-giving result. As a matter of fact, it actually has a tendency to damage relationships more than help them. Sorry for getting caught or sorry for because you feel bad are not the kind of sorrow that leads to life. But the result of godly sorrow is redemption, verse 10, right? There's this grief that, that's God-willed and there will be life. When there's godly sorrow that experiences the work of grace, there'll be salvation. Here, here's an example. There's this classic comparison between Peter and Judas in terms of the disciples of Jesus because uh, Judas betrayed Jesus. And to an extent, you, it, it is often said that so did Peter. Peter renounced Jesus. And so the, both of them have this back turning on Jesus. Judas Iscariot's sorrow can be captured in the words, I have betrayed innocent blood, and it just brought death. That's all it did. Peter, who wept bitterly, may have taken a more painful route and met Jesus face to face. But his sorrow worked redemption and restored his relationship with the Savior and his usefulness in the kingdom. You see, the difference there would be Judas Iscariot's sorrow caused him to go to a place where he just so internalized everything and he just hated himself. Like, woe is me for I have betrayed innocent blood. And so then he just takes it all upon himself. He doesn't reach out to Jesus for it, takes it on himself and ultimately ends up taking his life. This is literally sin that leads to, to death, sorrow that leads to death. And, and Peter's scenario is a little different. Like Peter had this immense sorrow and regret and yet he turned it towards Jesus and was restored. I mean, if you ever really want to do an interesting study, study these two guys um, side by side because it's something fairly amazing that takes place there. And in verse 11, it tells us that the re reason for godly sorrow is renewal. The reason for sorrow is not sorrow itself. Paul did not write this letter to make them feel guilty just for the sake of making them feel guilty. So many people feel bad enough about themselves already, and so the, the sorrow and grief or guilt that Paul's rebuke produced wasn't the end in itself, it was a means to an end. And it's the idea of the rebuke. The rebuke causes the person to take a step back and evaluate. And the reason for the sorrow is renewal. The sorrow you feel today is a means of renewal in your relationship with God. Is a relationship with God. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you? What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point you have proved yourself to be innocent in this manner. And so the point is that before they were careless as to their behavior, indifferent to what Paul taught, and even to what God thought of them, and certainly indifferent to this gross insult Paul gave them. But godly grief changed it. Sorrow that is in tune with God, responds with repentance, results in redemption, and the reason is renewal to restoring of the joy of their salvation. And so when sorrow is in tune with God, we see a couple of things take place. When sorrow is in tune with God, fellowship with Jesus is renewed. 
when sorrow is in tune with God, fellowship with Jesus is renewed. Hope is fulfilled. Hope is fulfilled. And usefulness to the kingdom of God will be multiplied. That's it. So the question then becomes this. It's just a simple question. Is your sorrow in tune with God? God experiences sorrow, grief, regret. And this is a relationship to how he feels when he needs to follow through on certain things as a just and holy God. It still pains him, but he does it. And he experiences grief all the time as we sin. Every time we sin, we grieve God. We got to hear that. Every single time we sin, we grieve God, period. And God's grief exists as man's sin persists. And yet there's hope in all of it. And the hope in all of it is that when we have a godly sorrow that causes us to move in towards repentance, there's renewal. We're, re we're fully redeemed. Like There's renewal. In other words, as far as the east is from the west, so the Lord removes our transgressions from us, right? And the result is awesome. Fellowship with Jesus is renewed, hope is fulfilled, and usefulness in the kingdom is multiplied. So is your sorrow, is your regret in tune with God? Here's another way to say it. When's the last time you repented of sin? When's the last time you, you took a deep look at self he looked at attitudes and words and actions and said, Lord, these aren't right in your sight. I repent. I want to leave my team. I want to join your team and be renewed. When's the last time? And if it's been a while, press stop, press pause, repent now. Just, just do it so that you can be renewed with Jesus and experience that life in Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for our time together. And I pray, Lord, Lord, that I would be a person who would be repentant and that everyone else who would take this in would also be repentant, that our sorrow would lead to repentance so that we can experience life with you, in you. And that life is abundant. I thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us here today. I hope that you have a fantastic rest of your week. And if you would like to go a little bit deeper with this message, you can find our home study guides on the website. Just go to pathwaycc.net slash homestudy or find it from the homepage. Have a great week.